My name is John Ferris. Uh, I'm from, uh, my first nation is from Kansas Lake. And um, I was born in Hearst, Ontario in 1959. But uh, I grew up in uh, a little village called uh, Pago River. Uh, so it was a uh, an old Hudson's Bay trading post and also the CN Rail used to run through there. Uh, and, and it did till I think the late 1980s. But anyways, there was uh, quite a few people that I would say maybe about close to 150 people in that little village. And there was an Air Force base about a mile west of us across the river. And um, uh, they were there for several years. And uh, we had a uh, one room uh, school. Um, and also we had a couple of churches there. And um, actually the school is still standing. And it's uh, actually, it's made into, um, I think a hunting camp now, but basically the the old structure is still still standing, and I did a couple paintings of it, so I'm going to do a few more in that in that regard. So, and uh, we lived there until 1965. I was six years old when we left there, and uh, we moved to um, the main line. My dad is a railroad worker, and. Um, we so he transferred to the main line on CN, and we lived in Fire River for I think it was just over a year, and um, then he was uh, promoted to uh, supervisor and uh, roadmaster to Foliat. So um, there was no school, but we uh, in Fire River for that year. And uh, which, uh, but we had to take correspondence. Of course, my dad was really strict in that, in that play, in that uh, regard to education. And uh, we moved to um, Foliat, so it was a real, uh, I guess, cultural shock for me because I've never went to a school where, uh, or been living in a town where there was white people. It was mostly uh, natives where I was brought up in that, so that was kind of different, and um, it was funny because uh, I had this one dog, my dog, my only dog I ever had, was, her, name, her name was Frisky, but she really kind of uh, helped me out that one day, going to school, uh, our, our first day of school, I was so, I was terrified that time, I think it was in, um, I think it was March or February we moved there. There was it was snow. There was snow there at that time, and um, so we went to school. It was a two-room school, so I thought I'd be in the same class with my brother. So <laughs> anyway, it happened when we got there. It happened to be that we were separated, and I was just really terrified. <laughs> so anyway, uh, my dog came along with me at that time. So as soon as we got into the class, I was, uh, I didn't know what to do. So I just sat in the back and uh, really scared. I didn't know what to say or how to act. And uh, uh, my teacher, this uh, lady, introduced uh, the class to me and vice versa. Then. I didn't know what to say. I had my hat, my head was bowed and uh, just kind of looking at the floor. Then I heard scratching at the window. I guess they had high banks, and it was uh, frisky scratching at the window. And then the teacher had asked me if that was my dog, and I said yes. I just shook my head at them, and uh, well, we're gonna let him in or let her in. Then I shook my head again. Then uh, she let him in and let her in, and she came sitting beside me, and all the anxiety left. <laughs> so 
So I was so glad, I was happy with that she was there with me and stayed with me all day in that class, you know. And then, uh, and so every day she would come to school with me, but she didn't come to class every day, but she waited for me every day. Even at lunchtime we'd go back home and come with me and stuff like that, so it was a really good uh, memory with her. And uh, one particular day, it was nice and sunny, and uh, we were walking down the road, heading home for lunch, and uh, there was this house which had a, a trail behind it and the road, and the intersection on the other side of the house. So anyway, we had the we came to this uh, trail and uh, the road where it continued, and. Uh, Frisky was beside me, and I, it seemed like she knew what I was about to do. And she took off down the road, and I took off into the trail, onto the trail behind the house. We, I ran, and she knew what I was going to do. We were trying to beat each other to the other side of the, to meet each other to the other end of the road there. So anyways, about halfway behind that house, I heard the this uh, gunshot and I stopped and I didn't know what was going on so it was on the other I heard that gunshot on the other side of the house then I seen Frisky run by on the road in a panic and I chased her and I didn't know what was going on so when I got home she was uh, um, she got shot, so she was wounded in that. I didn't know what happened. So that kind of, uh, like I was, I didn't know what that went on. But, yeah, that, that day we had to let her go and that, so it was kind of a sad day. And I was only seven years old at that time. But uh, that was, she was the only one, only uh, pet that I ever had. And uh, I kind of, kept it that way, but um, I often think about her at times because I, I still remember her clearly and that, so, so I, uh, and, and sometimes I think, uh, I don't know what it is sometimes, it's almost like she, she sensed something that was going to happen and it's almost like she, when I think about it, keep thinking about it, it's almost like she saved my life, maybe I was, I was it was meant to be the way it was set, so and I, and I often think about that. So anyway, <clears throat> so that happened, and we lived in uh, Foliat. Got to got really used to Foliat. I loved it there, and it's the first time we ever watched uh, or saw TV, I, I, and I was amazed. I was amazed at that little box. Uh, showing people pictures, live pictures, and uh, and uh, anyways, that was something new for me. And anyway, my dad had bought a TV later, later on for us, and and I would sit there and watch the news, any cheap program or whatever. I was just so amazed. I didn't know what uh, what to think, but it was really interesting to me. And I saw movies and shows and stuff like that. There was a good selection of uh, great movies at that time, and or shows, and that. So, anyway, going back to Pegua as a kid, and uh, talking about the artistic, uh, uh, my artistic career. I started. I used to look at my dad's Bible, family Bible. And look at these paintings and illustrations of the old masters. So this was really interesting to me because I don't know why, but I really like the shapes and the, and the drama behind these paintings and pictures. So, and uh, I used to get a pencil and start sketching just the shapes. I don't know why. Why was it the shapes I was after? So and then the figures and stuff like that, maybe do the head or maybe do parts of the body and just just going after the shapes. 
So I did that at that time and at an early age. And I was always trying to be precise in my drawings and, and uh, doing fine lines and just trying to be exact as what I, what I would see. So, and later on, like I said, we moved to uh, Foliat and, and we had a competition there at Christmas time. And uh, they wanted us to do a Christmas scenes, anything. So um, I used to look at these Tonka trucks in the catalogs. And uh, I remember what I really wanted at that time. So I drew a Christmas tree with all the ornaments and everything. I uh, colored it and then I had the uh, Christmas presents underneath and I had opened this one box with a Tonka truck in it. And I even drew on the box of the, of the Tonka truck and the truck outside of it. So I was really detailed in that uh, aspect of it. So, and um, I won first place. And they, it was a competition from uh, hosted by uh, Hudson's Bake store in town. So they had posted up on the window there for about a week. And that's why I won my first, uh, well, it's my first uh, art challenge in that competition. So it was, uh, I still think about it. And uh, and I, I think it was about maybe 10 years ago, I saw, I met the uh, manager at that, here in Thunder Bay at my, one of my arts and craft shows. And my dad introduced me to him. And this is the guy that was, the manager at the Hudson Bay store in Foley at, that had set up the show. So it was really uh, uh, astonishing for me to, to meet him and to see him and shake his hand. And so and uh, I had my own artwork there too at the show. So, I, so that was kind of a good thing for him to see how I even improved from the years and that. So, but that was, a, that was something something good. And um, we were, uh, li we lived in Foliat for about, I think about, about a year and a half. And then we moved to Armstrong, uh, Ontario. So, and, uh, and um, I continued my drawing career, my, uh, my drawing stuff and that there. We lived there for about two years, I think it was. And then it was, Nice, nice to meet new people. My dad had to move, you know, from job to job. I mean, um, as a supervisor in that sense. So, and um, it was good uh, to move and meet new people, new place, new everything. Uh, so we lived there for about uh, I think two years, and and it was nice, uh, a nice place. And then uh, we moved to, we were there for a while, then we moved to uh, Horn Payne. And uh, by that time I was about, uh, I think I was 10 years old, 11 years old at that time. And we w met the uh, principal, his name was uh, Mr. Timken. And he was, he um, was really nice, he was really nice. and. Uh, really nice introductory that he gave us there and, and asked us if we like art and that. And I said, yeah, I, I love art. So, and anyway, later on, as I was going to school there, I got more into my my art. We had art classes and that, and I was just, I couldn't wait for art, art class every uh, week, once a week it was on. So, and my principal would come in and take a look and see what I was doing and that and he got he used to get excited and he said well can you put some action into it and all this stuff so and um, so I do so right away when he tells me these things I can see all these uh, images in my mind and and I can put it into action just quick sketching and stuff like that I don't know what it was but it was it was something that I had and, I used to draw football players or hockey players or maybe somebody on a motorcycle, stuff like that. I can sketch it quick and being more, um, I guess, uh, elaborating a little bit more and uh, uh, 
proportional wise and things like that. So things fit and that. So that was a, a that was something I saw. But then again, that's what I learned from uh, uh, learning my drawing at, at an early age. Because I, I was thinking about the shapes and that's exactly what I went after. Just going back to uh, horn pain, uh, my principal would take me out of class prior to Christmas holidays for about a week to do murals on the walls. So I was the only one that was doing that. So I was in grade five at the time. So I did that till I was grade eight. So it was, it was, uh, I guess it was something that uh, I inspired more to as being a, being an artist and become, becoming more serious with it. But, uh, able to do large, uh, large size uh, drawings and artwork. So working with color, different colors and all that too. So it was, it was something that special to me at that time. So, uh, so Mr. Timken, my teacher or principal, um, really kind of uh, encouraged me to, I guess, become an artist. I know he kept a lot of my artwork as well, and some of the other teachers as well too. So, but um, and just uh, about a year ago, I never spoken with uh, I. I had a friend there, his name was, uh, well, a guy I went to school with in uh, Horn Payne. I think the last time I saw him was 1974. And uh, came across, on, across uh, seeing his name on Facebook and I contacted him and he, he remembered me. And uh, we had a chat and uh, we're supposed to meet uh, sometime soon. And uh, I guess uh, after we chatted there, he talked to his mom, his mother about it, and uh, she she remembered my artwork. She said, is that the guy that used to draw all the time or paint? Yeah, she said, I remember his work, so she was saying. So I thought that was good. I thought it was really neat. So anyway, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, at that time I was uh, involved more. I got more involved with my uh, art and our, I guess various artworks and I started doing a lot of uh, religious paintings or religious drawings as well too so and um, I did some portraits uh, landscapes and, uh, and some wildlife as well too so and uh, later on in the years um, I moved to more, um, Hearst or Constance Lake uh, where I went to high school in Hearst so I was I was there till I was 16. I wanted to go back. I wanted to go to work, and uh, uh, and that's what I did. I, I quit school at that time, and so I went to work, look for a job, and and found a job with uh, Wellwood of Canada in Long Lac. So I lasted there for about uh, about 10 months, and um, the funny thing is. The reason why I wanted, really wanted to go to work is because I wanted to buy a motorcycle. <laughs> so <laughs> I bought all these magazines through the year before I, and just looking at, staring at the magazine and saying, oh, I'm going to get this one, I'm going to get this one. So, And uh, I was determined that time to really get that bike, <laughs> which I did, I, which I did. So saved all my money, bought my motorcycle. Then uh, after ten months of working with with Wellwood, I decided to uh, to quit. So and just drive around with my bike, travel around with my bike. Then soon I realized you need money for gas. <laughs> so, <laughs> So anyways, I, but anyways, I went to back. To, I went to work again, look for, look for a job, and started working with CN Rail. So and uh, so I stuck with CN Rail for ten years, and that until 1990, 90, uh, 1985, uh, close to 86. So anyway, 
I've always wanted to go back to school. I thought about it and thought about it, and and uh, I felt like I was missing something in my life. I don't know what it was, but I just I, I knew there was something else that I could do, enjoy doing, and that. So, um, so I. Um, so in 1985, I uh, was done with CN and sort of for about, I think, uh, six months, I worked on my portfolio to enter a school in Toronto, several schools, but um, the main school was the uh, Ontario College of Art. At that time, it was called in 1986. So I went down for an interview. And about a month later, I was called, and uh, I was uh, I had uh, been accepted to one of the best schools in Canada, and that's where I went there and studied. And um, not too long after, maybe about maybe two weeks of going to school, a friend of mine, my classmate, had. Uh, um, introduced me to uh, this artist, portrait artist, a master portrait artist named uh, Michael John Angel. So he said he was at the, he, he had a studio at uh, Dundas and Kiel. So I'll take you there on Saturday, he was saying. So I said, sure, I'll go take a look. And we went into this old building and uh, it was, I guess, probably one of the first buildings ever built in that area. And anyway, we go knocking on the door. So John opens the door and walking into the studio, there's several rooms there. I was so amazed, uh, I, I didn't, my jaw just dropped and I just looked around and I was just amazed at what he had in there. And it's exactly what I've been looking for. It's, it's the old masters, copies of the old masters' paintings and drawings and there's sculptures there to draw from and stuff like that. And I, 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 I was just stunned. I, I was absolutely amazed. And this is what I've been, you know, I guess basically what I've been studying since I was a kid. So anyway, I started off there and it was it was a really good experience there. While I was still going to school down Terry College of Art, and and, uh, and just the way John had taught us and talked about how the process of uh, developing a drawing and that it's exactly what I was doing since I was a kid, going after the shapes. So I think that's why I. When I see things, I see them artistically, not just not just a thing or the object or what it is. It, it's what's around it is what I see. So, and it kind of uh, clears my sense of uh, producing something in that way artistically. And I, I I didn't realize that until he really elaborated on how to look at it. A subject before you draw it or paint it, for that matter. So those are the really uh, important things that uh, um, that I've learned through his school, his teachings, and also it wasn't. It, it became more than that because we learned the the history of the the artists themselves. He would talk about the artists, and he would um, also even talk about the recipes, various recipes that the old masters had used. And also we studied anatomy, we studied theory, we got color theory, all the history that was important in, the, in that respect. So, and my level of drawing, like, just developed at a higher level. And I was really, um, amazed of how much I've done and how much I've learned through that uh, that era. So I was there for three, three and a half years 
studying like that. And at the same time, I was going to Ontario College of Art and went to uh, George Brown College uh, Graphic Design for two years. And that was uh, another, another school I went to at the same time. So I was in Toronto studying for six and a half years before I moved back up north. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of training that I had in the field of fine arts. And uh, while I was down in Toronto, I used to think about my, my grandparents and my, I guess my culture in the sense of uh, comparing the old masters of how they used to, to uh, uh, work with raw materials. And, uh, and I remember as a kid, back in, back in um, Constance Lake in Pagua River, as a kid, I remember my grandfather um, bringing in the, uh, the, uh, a beaver that he trapped and the process of skinning it and saving, you know, the animal itself for food and uh, scraping the, uh, stretching out the beaver and then, uh, scraping the fat off and stuff like that. I used to sit beside him and watch him do all these things. And especially with um, the process of making their sinew or their lacing for, for uh, snowshoes and how my grandfather he bent the wood and that. I, I used to sit beside him and watch him. But, uh, but all these materials, that the raw materials that they were using, really, uh, it was almost the same thing as what I learned in Toronto. Like, I, I, went, I was getting flashbacks of, of uh, what the old masters had used, like even using gum from trees, different trees, and also the uh, different materials that they would paint on and what they would use, and animal fat as using a using a sizing for uh, adhesives in that so and all these things that uh, made a lot of sense and the plants different plants different rocks and minerals that they would use for their colors and things like that and their recipes so it kind of uh, so everything kind of clicked together so and uh, and so this kind of art that I studied in Toronto became not just art, but it became more of a science. And, and that's what really interested me, to keep on going in that. So I kind of looked at it both ways, science and art. Then I studied uh, Da Vinci and how Da Vinci saw things in, in his own way. And uh, he wasn't just uh, an artist, and he, he didn't do that many paintings or um, artworks. There was a lot of thinking behind his, uh, his uh, creations, you know. It was uh, mechanical, it was all engineering, and uh, the process of de <coughs> excuse me, developing these, these uh, I guess, uh, motorized vehicles that he he worked with, but it was more or less uh, uh, I don't know what you would call it there um, developed in uh, I guess uh, these are inventions that he had made by just uh, working by hand or uh, uh, just human I don't know human emphasis of uh, making these things mechanical and working. So, um, anyway, all these uh, studies that I had done with several uh, various uh, artists were really interesting. It was a history that I really loved. And, and um, today, uh, I can see that working with my own business and uh, also uh, thinking about my grandparents, how they survived and things like that with, uh, through 
I, I guess survival of trapping and also uh, in an artist, artistic sense of, or even developing or producing these uh, tools of survival, like mitts, hats, clothing, um, tools, stuff like that. So those were important to me. Now I, I, I start to see a lot of that. Um, but anyways, it's, uh, it was something that was back in my mind all this time, I guess. And it just kind of opened up as I was progressing and learning more about my own culture in that way, in that sense. <clears throat> so anyway, going back to my, my grandfather, when I was about four years old, three or four years old, I remember him clearly uh, working on his uh, producing these uh, uh, fine artifacts that were actually were the tools of survival, I guess. And uh, when I was eight years old, he made uh, a pair of snowshoes for me and for my older brother. And um, I remember those snowshoes, I was really excited to it, and it was all made, made by him. And uh, I used to follow him in this, on his trap lines. I would be with him all day just to be with him, you know, that's all I wanted, just to be with him and travel and go and check out his traps and that. And that's where I started learning more of what he, what he would do and how long and how hard it was to uh, maintain this lifestyle for a while. But it's natural for them though. But I've gone through that till I was 14 years old. You know, not all the time, but when we visited them. So my dad was on the railroad and we would come and visit them. That every chance I had, I would want to be with him and go in the bush and, and, uh, and just watch him, watch him do this. And um, I remember this one particular time, I think I was only about four years old or five years old. Uh, I used to go with him to go sell his fur. He had it rolled up. He would roll them up and put them in his pack sack and we would get on the school bus from Constance Lake to Hearst. So we'd be there in Hearst all day till four o'clock. So once we got into into town, my grandfather would go to the to uh, the Lands and Forest that was called office. We would go there and get it get his uh, fur stamp, then go to the Hudson's Bay and that's where he would sell it. So and then we you know, he'd get his money in that and go to a restaurant and hang out with him in town, in the city, or in the town. But um, I remember this one one time, I think it was in March maybe, as uh, snow was melting that time. He bought me a, a bike, a bicycle, and it had training wheels. So was, I, I still remember that day that we took it off the bus and that, and I was really happy. So it was really uh, something, and uh, yeah, the, I, I remember him very well. So it was, uh, you know, he was a big part of my life, <coughs> and still is, still is, because I, I, I think about him often, and he comes into my dreams as well too, and talks with me and that. So, so it's uh, it's kind of a it's a lifetime relationship. So he. Um, yeah, he passed on when I was 14 years old, or 15 years old, I think, and um, he had cancer. I was the last one that went in the, in the bush to go check his traps that time. He couldn't check all the traps. He, he was too sick, so we had to go back. So, mm -hmm. so we waited for our ride in the snowbank that time, so it kind of made things comfortable for him. We laid there for a while. He laid there for a while, and I watched over him. Well, that was the last time he uh, he was in the bush. So, but it, you know, I have a lot of good memories with uh, of him. So, which uh, you know, still lasts today. So I'm really uh, fortunate.